But tonight we're in um, Acts 28 uh, from verse 11 to 16. That's where we are. A Acts 28, verse 11 to 16. Now, before we dive into tonight, I have to just address something. You live in a world with unspoken ideas, assumptions that you fundamentally just know are true, that no one else in any century has ever thought possibly true. Just throwing that out there. Some things might even sound strange and counterintuitive. So, one of the, uh, one of the essential, essential ideologies of our day is that you as an individual matter most. The individual matters. Now, that's a good idea. Uh, but individualism is your view, your, the way you see the world. And it's unique completely to the 21st century, to you guys. I mean, you don't even question that. But think about your ideas and how compatible they would be with, say, even someone 200 years back. Like, just have an idea. Okay, so, 200 years back, years of 1824, uh, the world is actually going through a massive shift. Industrialism has happened. Uh, the world is changing globally. Uh, and you are seeing the world become interconnected in a way that has never happened in human history. However, no matter where you were born, you guaranteed were to do what your parents did. The idea of choosing a career path would have not even been absurd to them. They would have been like, what is wrong with you? Like, are you mentally deficient? And so I would have to be an insurance broker. Thank God we live in the 21st century. I'm just throwing that out of there. And if I chose, if I said, Dad, I'm going to the ministry, it would have been a great light on the broken shore name. In fact, the broken shores were pirates. So, I mean, I would have been anything. So. <laughs> and in fact, we were pirates at this time. So, I mean, I would have been a pirate. So. But, I mean, that's just one assume. You would have not done what you wanted. You would have done what was needed for the community. There was no such thing as a dream career. It was like, we need to survive. Do what's, do what's necessary. And, in fact... The idea of finding the love of your life was as pathetic as any other idea in the, in the 18th century. If you said to your dad, or, or you know, your mom or dad, I'm going to go and find the one, they would have beaten you and then probably institutionalized you. Because your job was not to find love. Your job, your duty, was to continue the family line. Romantic, isn't it? Hey. Eh? But that's exactly what the world was like. If you came to them, if you went at a time machine and went back and said, people, people, hear me out. You don't have to do what your parents did. You can marry who you want. Follow your heart. You're probably even burnt as a witch. Um, you know, these were so absurd as to be completely alien. But every single one of you don't question those ideas, right? Your life is about you. In fact, I would just throw this out there this, this evening. The majority, depending on where you are, but the majority of your stresses and your pains and your angsts in the last couple of weeks and months is, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Am I needed? Do I have a purpose? Am I happy? Is my spouse making me happy? It's all about you. And guess what? In the 21st century, this has crept into the church. We've made a church uh, because we can't help it. This is our cultural stream. This is what we think, breathe, eat, and, you know, whatever. We've made a church that is very much about you. So are you comfortable? You know, these blue chairs are a testimony that Waro fights the individualism. But 
Are you comfortable? Have you got what you needed? Has the sermon appealed to your sensibilities and made you feel good at the end of it? Has the worship touched your heart and made you satisfied? In fact, many a times growing up, I've had people saying, I am just no longer connecting with my church. I need to go somewhere else where I feel connected. And my thought to that is, that is not how life is supposed to be. In fact, that's what we're going to address this evening as we read through Paul's journey and how God conquers the world. I'm just going to put this out there. This is the theme. This is what you're looking out for. Do you know how God conquers the world? Through His family. Through a community. Through us. So let's read. After three months... Sorry, I'm at verse 11. After three months, we were put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in, uh, in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship, and the figureheads were the twin gods of Castor and Pollux. We were put in a, uh, Syracuse, and we stayed there three days. From there, we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day, the south wind came up, and the following day, we reached Pitalui. There we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to speak a week with them. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers and sisters there had heard that we were coming. And they traveled as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. The sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. And when we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Now, what I love about this text, and, and something we're not going to pick up, is how um, Luke perfectly interacts and plays a game with the spiritual world that is relevant in the, 20, uh, in the first century and the physical world of what's happening on the ground, his story that, he t- uh, that he's telling. And in fact, in this, he shows us how Jesus conquers the false gods. And it's really profound when we go into that. Now, to understand that, We need to understand that the entirety of the ancient world was driven by the gods. Your entire community, the entire basis of your fellowship, of the ancient world centered in and was controlled by the gods. Religion was the center reality of the world of the first century. So if you wanted to belong, find your god and the people that followed that god and you belonged. It was unquestionable. That was the nature of the world. Do you know what's fascinating? Is it's the church that destroyed that. If that was still alive today, do you know what it would be? We'd be divided by the, the gods of the races, the gods of the cultures, the gods of the areas we grew up. And you know what? We would never be able to be together. But look at this hodgepodge of people. I mean, your pastor's from a line of pirates. (laughs) My gods were cooler. (laughs) No, I'm joking. (laughs) There was no fellowship. There was no possibility of fellowship. And the church destroyed that. The church made a true unity of humanity, a fellowship of humanity. And this leads us to the first point, which is false and true brothers. It's actually no mistake that Paul mentions the ship they were on and the fact that on the ship was carved the twin gods of Castor and Pollux. It's not like, you know, Luke was trying to add, you know, embellishment. That's not how Luke writes. Luke wants us to think. We read over this, and in fact, uh, commentary after commentary Uh, that I read this in preparation of this message, was like, this is a peculiarity of a plot point. And I'm like, no, man. Luke is not a peculiar plot point kind of writer. It's just not how he writes. And the Holy Spirit doesn't inspire him to write that. Nothing in this text is by mistake. In fact, this makes a clear point. If we just step back and ask the question, who were these gods? And why mention them? Well, again, let me go back to the point. Nothing happened into the world that 
this boat was driving and the world that Luke, uh, Paul was living in and Luke was writing about without gods. Nothing. So who were these gods? Who were Castor and Pollux? Well, they were the twin sons of Zeus. And they were associated with the constellation Gemini. And these were the powers that guided and helped sailors on their journey. They were the journeying brothers. And in fact, that's why they were on an Alexandrian ship. This was the supernatural protection and guide for the journeyer and his or her travels. So let's just stop and ask what is being communicated by that? Well, think about the world. If you want to get safely to your destination, join the fellowship. Come on board with the gods who are going to get you to your destination. And I love the contrast. Because what has happened to Paul over the last couple of weeks? Has he been guided safely? Has he had a successful journey? Yes, even though it's been horrific. But he gets on board and he gets to his destination. And it's not the gods that get him there, but God himself. It's not the false gods who have granted the sailors good journey, but the will of the true God of heaven and earth. And then Luke doesn't stop there. And this is where this passage becomes so profound and brilliant. This is where Luke's storytelling becomes absolutely brilliant. Paul is going to be the instrument of God to the Gentiles, right? And up until this point, he's literally been protected from being killed by the Jews. By who? Gentiles, by Romans. And when he comes to the end of his journey on this ship with the fellowship of the twin gods of sailors, who does he meet? Who is he encouraged by? Well, Luke tells us, he says, brothers and sisters ran out to meet us. In fact, brothers and sisters from Rome went as far as, and he mentions the two places, to come and greet us. And what is Paul's answer? That he was greatly encouraged by this. And church, this is the lesson. And in fact, it's a lesson for us today. It's a profound lesson. Our strength for the journey is found in God working through our community. Do you know that? It's not through the gods. It's not through luck. It's not through us doing it by ourselves and stiff up a lip. It's through the community. We get courage from each other. Do you realize that? We get courage from each other. In fact, when Paul lands, it's the brothers and sisters that gather around him and give him help. I just need to throw this out there. You need each other. You just do. You desperately, desperately need each other. In fact, the whole point of this narrative is to contrast the naval camaraderie with that of the church and how the church is superior. You need the church. I, I really was laboring at to, to make this a, a, an important message this evening because something that, that broke in the human spirit was through COVID. Do you realize that? We were forced into isolation. And you know what the problem about isolation is? It's actually addictive. I don't know if you realize that. Let me ask you a question. I don't know how it's relative it is with the younger people. I mean, young people just make friends and they want to get out, they want to go. But you know how hard it is post-COVID to get people together? Everyone's too busy. Everyone has too much on. And actually, you know what the real is? We, we, we've gotten comfortable with being alone. And I want to ask you a question this evening, church. Does being alone help you? Even for me, I am a by nature introvert. In other words, 
Spending too much time with people exhaust me. Uh, and I, I'm, it's not you, it's me, you know. You know it's, it's. But uh, a couple of weeks back, my sister came out from Oz, and we had the BU assembly at the same time. And so it was get from the get-go onto the hill, and you're networking. You're meeting people, you're chatting, everyone's asking you. And it's go, 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 chat, 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 stop, go meet with my sister, spend time, chat, 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 chat. By the end of the week, I felt like I was dying. I couldn't believe how tired I was. Because I'm used to spending a lot of time in books and alone, and I was just exhausted. But it still was good for me. So even an introvert like me, I need the fellowship. But you actually need the fellowship of not just friends. That's the important part. Uh, C.S. Lewis, in his brilliant book uh, called The Four Loves, deals with this. And he, he, he makes clear what we fundamentally make an error of within the church. Most of us actually spend all of our time in philos, brotherly love. Love of people who are like us, who share our reality. I don't know if you've met someone and they are just your people. Have you met them? And like it's instantly, there's no like, as they start speaking, you're like, I got you. And you just start throwing up. I mean, just this last weekend, we went to uh, Lauren's ballet. It was brilliant. And one of Lauren's friend's dads started talking to me. And we're like, you know, it's awkward. You know, it's, you don't know the person from a bar of soap. And so I said, oh, so, so, so what are you doing? And he's like, no, I'm studying to get a PhD in theology. Lights on. Like, I was like... <laughs> Okay, what you're studying? Eventually, Natalie's sitting in the car. She's like, "Can we, can we sort, can we organize a bri? Because I want to leave." I'm like, "No, no, no, no. It's fine. Uh, okay, we'll sort out a bri. Let's, you know." There was no issue. Like the the time ran because there was more to talk about than there was time. Right? Have you do you know those people? Well, guess what happens? You tend to hang out with those people, right? You tend to not hang out with people where you sit down. And they start talking about something that you have no clue with. Hey, did you watch the soccer match this Friday? No. <laughs> I actually remember I, we went on holiday the one year and we met with someone. And I, I, I'm easy, I can make conversation with anyone. So I sat down with a guy and I'm like, ah, oh, so, so what do you work at? He's like, no, I grow, uh, I mean, I, I'm in the textile industry. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Uh, no, it's not really. <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> Okay, um, what textile? Angora goats. I'm like, oh, okay, is there a lot of market? Yeah, it's pretty busy. <laughs> I'm like, are you interested in this or not? So then I'm like, you know when you're trying to fish for like, what is this person, what are they like, what are they like, and just shut down, shut down, shut down. We don't spend time with people like that, right? It's exhausting. And so what do we do in church? We find our people and we glue to them because the other people are exhausting. But how has God designed this thing? Don't know if you've realized this yet, but there's people who you don't get along with here that aren't your philos, but they are your storgi, they are your family. And we're called to be together. You're called to be together. In fact, you are in a group of people that shouldn't naturally connect together. And yet God has called you together. So what holds this community together? That's the question we want to answer tonight. It's not a sense of camaraderie. It's not that we gather around the same action. You know, we're not part of the same guild. How many of you are in the guild of theology? So I'm alone. I've got no friends. Come on. <laughs> right? We've got multiple guilds here, multiple fractions. Let's put it out there. If this was the old world, there would be multiple gods. It would be Castor and Pollux. But the community of believers in a foreign land with no connection to Paul Come out and encourage him. Isn't that, an, isn't that a beautiful, beautiful picture of what the church is? 
Church, we are not connected by ethnicity, by our personalities, by our worldview. We are connected by simple and undeniable truth. We are children of the Most High God. That's what binds us together. That's what forces us together. That's what connects us. We are connected by one simple reality. Everyone here is saved by grace through faith in Jesus. We have the same Father and we're brothers and sisters. It's the gospel that unites us. And that simple truth that we are saved by grace through Jesus. And that's a profound impact on the way this community works. Because guess what? We're going to have people come into this community that aren't like us. And we can't gather around creed or camps or age, or ethnicity, we gather around the fact that this is a fellow child of God. That's what unites us. That's what holds us together. That's what binds us. And I think that's what Luke is connecting us to. It's the brothers who come out and connect with Paul, a Jew from Rome. In fact, let's just ask uh, from, uh, a Jew from Jerusalem with the people of Rome. Let's just ask a question as we, as we do the third point. What connects Paul to the people of Rome? Well, that they need each other. That's it, our third point. I, I don't find it at all a mistake that Paul was fed by the church in Rome. In Rome. The center of the oppressive world. Just, just picture, there can't be more two divided people. A Jew who the Romans hated because Palestine was a backwards little st um, a state that no one cared about. And these Jews were people that made a complete ruckus of the um, Roman Empire. And Romans, who the Jews hated, because the Rome, Romans were the ones that invaded their land and conquered and destroyed their temple. So what does a Jew have with the community of Rome? Well, let's ask the question. What was that community of Rome? Was it full of Jews? Well, we can go to the New Testament to prove that. It wasn't. In fact, Paul writes an entire letter to try and make sure that this church of Jews and Romans stays together. It's called the book of Romans. Read it. In other words, this was a hodgepodge of community that comes out and meets a random traveling apostle on a ship with two false gods. And what happens? Paul says, I thank God I'm greatly encouraged. He's greatly encouraged because this hodgepodge of people is a reality that transcends the guilt. It transcends the gods. It transcends that which divides us. It's a community where a traveling preacher from a hated province could come into the center of the world and that community runs out to meet him. Church, that's still happening today in the 21st century. I don't know if you get that. Church, we are a miracle. Do you, do you understand that? We are a miracle. We are held together by something that truly transcends us. And if we forget that, I just need to warn you, if we forget that, we'll be ripped apart instantly by the things that divide us. If you don't believe me, go to look at church history. As soon as we forget the gospel, we divide. We're a miracle. Do you realize in this room tonight, there are far more things that could divide us than can hold us together? I'm sure you felt that tension. Man, it's my great stress that I'll do something stupid one day because, you know, I'm a stupid human being that'll cause a, a crack right along one of those fault lines. Because there's, there's more that divides us than holds us together. That's the nature of being human. Don't you notice that with your group of friends? Don't you notice that with your, career, your communities that you're involved with at schools or business? 
People are looking for reasons to divide, yet we are together. Wilro, we are together. Why? Because we have something that transcends us. Jesus loves me, and Jesus loves you. We also have something that unites us. You're a sinner, and I'm a sinner. And if Jesus loves this sinner, I can love that sinner. Didn't point at anyone in particular. Sorry, Caleb. <laughs> That's the miracle that holds the church. And it's the miracle that will hold us until he comes for us. And so church, I want to give you, now I'm going to actually beg for you to focus in on what holds us together. Can we gather around the glory and the wonder and the beauty that we have the same God who loves this chief of sinners as he loves you? Let's pray. As we come before your throne this evening, Lord, each of us, each and every one of us, do not come by our own merits, but only because of Jesus. So, Jesus, we commit ourselves to that. We commit ourselves to you, to your love, to your grace, to your gospel. And so I pray for war, O Lord. I pray. The same prayer that you prayed for your church. Lord, may we be one as you are one. May we love each other as you have loved us. For this is how the world will know that we are your disciples. Oh Lord, we need grace in that. We need the gift of your spirit. And so pour it out and bless us with it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you stand as you sing our...